So we want to finish up the semester doing case studies. So application, we'll be seeing many of the risks that we talked about before. We're going to start with an operational risk with Tylenol and talk about the operational risk, which came definitely outside of the firm. Uh, you could debate that they should have done something in advance, but since they didn't, the way they handled it after it hit, it was a sabotage of their product is considered to be one of the best cases of public relations management for reducing the severity of a loss. Then we'll talk about firms like Chipotle who had a food poisoning problem, Blue, Blue Bell that had a, a product problem uh, with, with something getting into their food, United Airlines which obviously was a, just a headline risk and we'll, we'll talk through these. Um, the, the doctors making mistakes and admitting mistakes, there's an article on Blackboard that we'll go through on that. So let's start with an operational risk. And here the focus really is, so this is an operational risk where the focus is on risk reduction, reducing severity because the loss has already happened. Something bad has already gone wrong. So our goal now is we can't do risk prevention. We can't reduce severity. We can't reduce frequency. It's already happened. So frequency is 100%. So the goal is: can is there is something we can do to reduce the severity of this event? So let's look at Tylenol again. Remember your goal for the exam question is to give a quick synopsis of what happened, and then talk about the particular risk, what category it is. So this is operational risk, and talk about the risk management techniques that they use and whether they are effective or not. And I'll leave it up to you. There are some subjective things, your opinion, what you think is the right answer here. But, but Tylenol, they had the extra strength tablets. They con con contain, six, contain 65 milligrams of cyanide. That's 1,000 times more poison than was needed to kill somebody. Um, so the victims never had a chance. Death was certain within minutes. The nation was warned about the danger as soon as connection could be made. In fact, there's some uh, pretty interesting stories of, uh, I think it was a fireman who discovered it. You should go out and read some of this history. It's, it's interesting how um, people just put, put, put it together with that. It wasn't obvious at first what was causing this, what was connection. You know, you look at where they ate, um, if, there's, if they're in the same neighborhood, if they went to the same place. Um, did they consume the same food, the same packaging? And so finally they discovered it was Tylenol. So they announced it over loudspeakers. National television networks reported about the deaths. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration advised consumers to avoid Tylenol. I mean, that's not what you want to have, the, you know, the major food regulatory of the nation telling everyone, stop using your company's product until these series of deaths in Chicago could be clarified. They, the authorities concluded that any temperance must have occurred once Tylenol had already reached Illinois. So they discovered it didn't happen in Tylenol plants. So that was good news for Johnson & Johnson that they could say it wasn't one of our employees. It wasn't us not taking good care of our equipment. We, we, we sent it out and once it got out of our control, someone tampered with it at that point. So Tylenol has a little bit if it's not our fault. And they could have stopped like that right there. Uh, we have, there have been some cases, uh, Perrier was a water maker. Uh, I believe it was Perrier, it may have been one of the others, but I'm pretty sure it was Perrier had, had an issue and it might be in this article. Uh, their approach is, hey, it wasn't our fault, we're not gonna do anything. And so Tylenol could, taken that, could have taken that approach. Hey, someone tampered with our product, it wasn't us, our processes are fine, it's out of our control. What do you want us to do about it? So they could have taken an aggressive approach or they could have taken a passive, it wasn't our fault. And you're gonna see they took a very press, a, aggressive approach. So it was tampered with and was placed back on the shelves of five different stores. People in the cities across the country were admitted to hospitals for suspicion of poisoning. You know, some of that was was uh, maybe, you know, people felt a little sick and so they, on the eye of caution or maybe paranoia. And then also whenever you, whenever this sits the news, you have copycats, people who are doing the exact same thing. There's a famous story we talked about in my life insurance class of a lady who's, who, her, who poisoned her husband. But when the authorities got there, they just assumed he died of natural causes. And, and so she, she, 
ended up tampering Tylenol pills, putting them on the shelves, and then calling, uh, and a lady died. A lady died of this tampering. And so she kills this lady, and after she kills this lady, she calls the authorities and say, hey, we had Tylenol just like that in our house, and my husband died not too long ago. I'm just wondering if maybe I have the same problem. And so they took her Tylenol, and, sh Tylenol, and sure enough, it had cyanide in it as well. Well, she had bought a life insurance policy that had a double indemnity, which meant if her husband had died of natural causes, she would have gotten $40,000. But if he died of an accident, she would have gotten $80,000. She would have gotten double as much with an accident. And so she wanted it, her husband's death ruled as an accident so she could get twice as much life insurance. And so the authorities looked and said, yeah, sure enough, your husband was murdered by this Tylenol. The problem was when she mixed the Tylenol, she mixed it in the same container that she made her, her fish food to feed her fish tank. And they discovered that in the Tylenol um, and they linked it to her and she ended up going to jail just to get not very much money. She had essentially gotten away with the perfect crime. She would not have been, she would not have been uh, found. She would have gone the rest of her life with the life insurance and her husband gone. But because she wanted extra money, she, so that's the copycats. She took advantage of that story. She wasn't the main story. I had, at one point, I thought maybe she was the main story, but she wasn't. She was one of the copycats. So there may have been inflated his, by the hysteria, the hysteria of the consumers who blame any type of headache or nausea. So again, it could have just been uh, paranoia. So what does Tylenol do? You're, you're the CEO of Johnson & Johnson. What do you do? Do you completely shut down this product? Do you keep offering it? Do you take it off the shelves even though you know it's probably only in Chicago and it's a very local thing? What do you think? Um, and there are some people who said, that's the end of Tylenol. They, they'll never be able to sell Tylenol under that name again. And you know Tylenol is still sold today. And Tylenol has lost some of its market share, but not because of this incident. It's lost it because there's new competitors coming in. At this point, Tylenol was, had, had the majority of the market, I mean, or the large portion of the market, very popular painkill pill. <clears throat> and here's, here's a journalist saying, they'll never be able to sell Tylenol ever again. So here's the response, phase one, what does Johnson & Johnson do? So Tylenol is one of the top selling over-the-counter drugs in the country. Um, so Johnson & Johnson's handling the Tylenol tampering case is considered by public relations experts to be one of the best in, in history of public relations. So it did not take long for Tylenol to go through this crisis, have to shut down, and then after shutting down, coming back and getting back to where they were before. Uh, so what did they do? <clears throat> so two phases. The first phase was handling the crisis. The second phase was public relations. So stage one is we got to we got to do something now. I think when you look at Bluebell and you might, if you choose this one for your your exam, you might do some googling of Bluebell in Ch Chipotle and see how they handle it. I don't think Bluebell handled it very well at all. Bluebell's product was it wasn't tampering. It was actually a problem at one of their plants, and management downplayed it. Uh, it it kind of hid it from the public for a while, and then. You know, Bluebell has a reputation for being very popular. You know, they, they're loved in Texas as a Texas company. Uh, they could have really destroyed themselves in the way they handled this crisis. And I think they handled it pretty badly, but it sounds like it didn't harm them that much. But you never know. These are extremely important situations for companies to hand, handle right. So Tylenol, first, say, let's take care of the crisis. Let's stop killing people. And then let's see if we can use public relations to get this product back. It's an extremely profitable product for us. So their decision was, let's put customer safety first. So forget about profits, forget about other finance concerns, including forgetting about the lawyers and lawsuits. Let's don't say, let's don't go out and say, hey, this wasn't our fault. Let's say, hey, we're doing everything we can to reduce the risk. So they immediately alerted customers. They told consumers not to resume using the product until the tampering could be determined. That's something Bluebell did not do. It's something Perrier did not do. And one thing they did was was probably over overdone. They probably they probably could have gotten away with not doing this, but they recalled Tylenol from the market. One hundred million dollars worth of product. They recalled it. They could have just recalled it in the Chicago area because it's pretty obvious it was just Chicago. There weren't any other. So he, so here's a, here's a Perrier. 
Um, so Perrier, instead of holding themselves accountable, accountable for the incident, they claimed that the contamination resulted from an isolated incident. And then they discovered that actually the source was actually the part of their, uh, their, their process. They were criticized for having little integrity and for disregarding public safety. I hate Perrier. I don't know why anyone drinks it, but it, it, it does have a following. And so, you know, it, it's, it's an important product. And for, for Perrier, it is their product. For, Tylenol, for obviously Johnson & Johnson has many other products. So Johnson & Johnson established relations with the Chicago police, FBI, Food and Drug Administrations. You can think about this in terms of airlines. We're going to talk about United, but I'm not talking about United and dragging the man off the plane. I'm talking about airlines when there's an airplane crash. Airlines are notorious when there's a crash of not saying anything, of just being type-lipped, not refusing to provide any information, refusing to say they're sorry about what's happened and showing any sympathy whatsoever. And it makes the families so mad because they're they're completely shut out. They have no information what's going on. It makes and we'll talk about this with doctors as well. It makes them more likely to sue. Whereas Johnson and Johnson comes right out and they say we're going to be completely transparent. We're going to help whomever we need to. So they were given positive coverage. So what they actually did be by being, being so transparent, not only with these groups, but also with the media, they got positive media coverage. So the Washington Post, they applauded Johnson & Johnson for being honest with the public. They added that the company never attempted to do anything other than try to get the, to the bottom of the desk. So their number one goal, right at phase one, was to figure out what went wrong and be transparent about it. Is it our fault? If it's not our fault, what do we need to do? Uh, it almost seemed impossible for Johnson & Johnson to be held responsible for any of the temperings. The corporation had a hard decision to make. Should they implement, implement a nationwide recall of the product? Uh, three of the victims of the poison capitals were, were buried that Saturday after all this happened. That's, so that's more media coverage. The televisions are covering these funerals. J Johnson & Johnson executives wept not only know out of grief but out of guilt. Uh, 31 million bottles of Tylenol capsules would be pulled off uh, merchandise sales, so that's the $100 million. And they offered exchange the capsules that had already been purchased for new protected ones. So there's phase one. Uh, Johnson & Johnson's lawyers disagreed with some of this. They felt like it's, like, it's almost as if we're admitting guilt. We're going to make it more likely for people to sue us. And the president of Johnson & Johnson said no. We're going to do whatever it takes to make sure no one else dies from our product. So phase two is the public relations. So they had 37% of the market for this, for painkillers. And so they had to unleash a heavy marketing promotion program to bring Tylenol on bike. But once they got media on their side, they were able to use media to get free public, public publicity without having to pay for it. You almost think about Trump and his election his presidential election, how much free uh, press he gets by being just such an outrageous person in what he would say. It's, it's, you, know, you wonder if going forward that's not going to be the approach for running for president. If, if you can get all that free press just because the press is almost just enamored with you um, and you get good ratings just by covering them. So here at Tylenol, they, had, they, they made sure the press was positively um, impressed and, and somewhat positively working with them to give them as much free press as possible. So they reintroduced the, reintroduced the product, but they introduced it with a triple seal temper resistant packaging. Now some people have complained that Tylenol should have already had this packaging before this, this happened because products have been tempered with before. So you could debate that. This, this case is almost always presented in a positive light. Uh, especially in marketing classes and, and talking about how to handle you know, the brand. Uh, but you could argue that, that they should have already had this in place. This is not a completely randomly new thing. They offered coupons that were good to work purchases of the product. They had a new advertising program. program. And then also the distribution side, the salespeople. Um, they made presentations to people in the medical community. Let's make, the, make sure the medical community is on our side. Uh, this industry obviously has some history with um, how they treat the medical community. You're kind of wondering why the medical community promotes some of their products. Is it because the product's the best or because some of the perks that they get from 
pushing certain products, but that's outside of this case. Um, so they're essentially getting free advertising for the new packaging. Um, other companies are also using packaging, but but Tylenol gets the gets the press because of what happened um, with the with the tampering. So they gained back much of the market that they had lost. The article continued that the media trend of publicizing their comeback in a positive light. So the conclusion, the culture of Johnson & Johnson drives good risk management. That's the story that comes out. Now, you can go out and Google lawsuits against Johnson & Johnson. Johnson & Johnson has some pretty horrendous lawsuits against them. I think you can question if good culture drives all of their risk management. The pharmaceutical industry has some terrible, terrible black eyes. Now, you might be on their side that this is a bad press, but you should read some of those cases. But in this particular case, situation, given that their product was causing major harm to even those, even if it was just a few people, they act aggressively and quickly. Um, so they turned to their credo. Their credo was consumers, um, consumers, medical professionals using the product, employees, communities, the people where they work and live, all of these were important, including their stockholders. So let's put, you know, this is the stakeholder argument. Let's put everyone that we impact first. Um, cooperate fully with the media. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. That's why I think you can bring Bluebell into this. You can bring Perrier into this. You can bring um, uh, Chipotle into this, airlines. Um, so from that point on, the media did the work for the company. It was the widest US, U.S. news coverage since the assassination of Prince, President Kennedy. So it was getting incredible news coverage. You won't know about it because you weren't alive at that time. So that's Johnson & Johnson. So let's talk about other situations. So let's talk about medical malpractice lawsuits. This is an article about should doctors admit mistakes and apologize. Most don't. Their lawyers are told tell them, their insurance companies tell them, if someone dies on operating table, whether you know if it's a mistake or not, don't say anything. So when doctors make mistakes, admitting the error, saying I'm sorry, and offering compensation may help prevent lawsuits. So this this was actually an experiment, a test. The program, program included a procedure for telling patients and their families about errors. Can you imagine what lawyers are saying about that? explaining who made the error, how it occurred, and what steps were taken to prevent a similar mistake in the future, making a sincere apology to the patient and their family, offering fair compensation for harm when at fault. The result was a reduction in the number of lawsuits and other compensation claims, faster resolution, so that means the hospital's legal bills go down. So does that always make sense? This is one case. So how much did it come down? After healthcare providers began admitting mistakes, apologizing, and offering compensation, the rate for new claims fell from just over 7 for 100,000 patients to 4.52, so a 36% reduction. The time it took to resolve the claims dropped by several months, while the cost of the liability fell by 60%. So the average, so we're talking about frequency, the frequency came down 36%. The time to deal with this came down and the ultimate cost, the severity came down. So tremendous drop all the way around. So it's, it's interesting. So the program started with the belief that doctors had an ethical obligation to disclose mistakes and it followed, followed that by making a fair offer of compensation was also the right thing to do. They really didn't know how it was going to do to what it was going to do the cost. The sincerity, the honesty, and the transparency were the big drivers. There is a lot of research that has shown that when people are upset or when they feel there's a lack of honesty, they are more likely to sue. That's what I talk about the airlines and airline crash crashes. You go back and look at some of the histories of those and how frustrated the families are sitting around waiting to see what do you know and airlines know a lot and they're just not sharing anything. Our study does not prove a disclosure and offer program will reduce liability. What it does show is doctors and hospitals can do this and not break the bank. So at least there's some evidence it doesn't automatically ensure a lawsuit that's going to be multiple times larger. Um, so interesting case. What I'll do at the beginning of the next class, this is our last session of this class, 
is I'll give you a synopsis of the United Airlines case. It won't take probably the entire session. I was trying to find the presentation Paul did, and I, I can't find it. I think he gave it to us last time. Um, but if not, I, I remember it fairly well, and I can give you a, a good summary of, of what he presented. So that's our first case. It's kind of a feel-good case of be honest, care for those people you could be harming, put that first, put the lawyer second, put the fear about lawsuits second, and it may actually work out better. But that may not be the case at all all the time, but at least there is some evidence that at least in some situations that's true.